you know, Hashem uh, w alerted Moshe that uh, his mission was not necessarily going to be the smoothest mission. And he does tell Moshe that he's going to, at, at, well, at some point, even know that, that Hashem will harden his power heart. We'll talk more about the, the process, the stages, the, uh, the, the players, etc. Et but but at, the, at the beginning of this morning, this week's Pasha, so this week's Pasha starts with the eighth plague. We have three plagues in, in Pasha's bow. And the eighth is the Arabe, the plague of the locust. And the Pasha opens up and says, Vayomer Hashem el Moshe, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, I take that word back, that, that's not there in the Hebrew. Hashem sp spoke to, to Moshe, Bo el Paro, go to, appear before Paro, Ki ani hichpaliti et libo v'leya v'adav l'manchitir v'tay el v'kebo. For I have made his heart and the heart of his servants, meaning like his advisors that would hang out with him and, and join in the, in the decision-making process to some degree. That, that God has made their, their hearts, you know, it's from the word kave means to, to be heavy. In the translation I'm looking at says stubborn, but the, the, little, the literal translation would be something that God made the, the hearts of these people to be uh, heavy and, and that that would serve a purpose that Hashem can bring uh, various signs into the, the midst of this population. So the fact that God did some type of action to make Paro stubborn is potentially a big philosophical question. I'd like to deal with that from a few different sources, but I'd like to start with the Rambam, with Maimonides. And we find the, the appropriate references to this discussion in the Rambam's Hilchos Tshuva, the laws of repentance. And I wanna share with you a few excerpts from that section. So the Rambam states, Rishut l'chol adam netuna, that, that permission is granted to every human, that if he wants to lead himself in, in a path of goodness and to be righteous, how we should be ado. He, she has that permission. And we're not talking only about Jewish people. This is all, all people. And if he wants to lead himself in, in, uh, in an evil way and to be an evil person, Harish should be a doe. That's also, he's not supposed to do that, but it's his decision, his or her decision. They want to choose that, they can choose that. And the Rambam, Maimonides says the, the earliest source for understanding this comes from the Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden episode, where Hashem's you know, announcing some concern about the human being eating already from one uh, for the tree that was the Eight Sadat, the tree of knowledge that was forbidden to him. So the Hashem makes the statement, Hain Adam Menu that the human being is like us to be able to distinguish, to know between good and bad. And the Rambam, now the Rambam was 13th century. The Rambam says that throughout the world there are uh, you know when it, when it comes to these principles people are foolish 
very rampant reality that people don't understand, the concept of free will, freedom of choice, and even among many Jewish people, the less educated, do not understand the, the, the concept, that many people think that Hashem predetermines the course that a person will take, that designates him, that that he'll either be righteous or, or he'll be evil. Ein hadavar kain. The Rambam says no, no such thing. But every person can be as righteous as Moses, our teacher, or wicked as Yeravam, the wicked king. Any person can take a path of wisdom, you know, with wisdom or a foolishness, a person could be merciful or he could be cruel, he could be uh, generous or he could be a, a miser, etc., etc., et says the Rambam, not expressing the other traits, referring to them, but there are a lot of different tra character traits and, 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 and actions that we decide to take, and all of those are up to us. Hashem's not going to to force that person to be one way or, or another. And then, just for the, a little bit more of the background information, the Rambam says that a, that a person who does choose to follow a path that's not within the divine prescription, so there are some sins that a, a person will receive divine retribution, consequences, one might want to use the word punishment, consequences probably be better because hopefully the consequences will lead to something more positive that could have been chosen before the need for uh, painful consequences. So the Roman says that there are some sins that those consequences are visited upon a person in this world. There are other sins that the person receives no negative consequences in this world, but when it comes to the next dimension, after a person leaves this world, that consequences will be delivered in the realm of the world to come. And there's there are other sins that, I don't think this is the origin of the expression, and it would be, um, you know, sarcastic in this sense, but you get the best of both worlds or you get the punishment in both worlds. You get part of the punishment in this world and part of the punishment in the world to come. Now, when, when does this apply? Ask the Rambam, meaning, you know, when do we have to face the terrible consequences that's bizman shelo asat shuva. That's if a person hasn't done repentance. But if a person has done repentance, it's it's it, in many cases. It's not not no. Rambam doesn't specify this here, but here the Rambam just says that if you if, if a person repents. It's like putting up a, a shield, a, a curtain that, that will shield the person from the negative consequences. In, in a more detailed fashion, it would depend on the intensity of the sin, on other reflections we may, may have done, what we, what we might look at as understanding as a message you know, something doesn't go right. Maybe it's not the worst thing. It doesn't go right, and we start changing our, you know, ourselves. There are a lot of different things that can fit into the formula, but the basic formula is, is that there is this concept of repentance, and that can, that can change them. It's, it's it's an amazing thing. It, it it's it's a gift, and you know, one might even say it's not even rational. It wouldn't be expected because at least on the level of between the human being and God, that tshuva, repentance, allows us to reformulate the past. 
Now you just normally see that just you know on, in movies or read them in books. You know, going going into a time machine and trying to correct something, prevent something from happening that could have disastrous consequences if it's going to take place the way it's it's heading. So to think that we can change something. Now I emphasize between us and Hashem because if I've wronged another person. I can be very, very sincere in my regret, but if I'm if I don't make it right by that other person, if I there may be I may have financial consequences if I damage something or or cause him expenses, I may need an apology for insulting him. Uh, whatever the case might be, that that involves having to to uh, sort of erase my debt with that other person as well, and then there's the God's side of that. And then there are items just be, uh, between us and God, so it becomes less complicated in terms of, of that process. But so this is a, the, the, tshuva is a tremendous, a tremendous gift from Hashem that does allow us to a, a significant degree to change the past and to move ahead uh, on a better path in the future. The Rambam here discusses, and this is the connection to the section of Torah that we're reading now, and, uh, and, and is a reality in, in the human experience, so it applies, it could apply to people today, is that it could be that because of a person's sins, that God revokes that special gift of tshuva from that sinner. That some people don't have this exceptional path of changing, of changing their ways. And that God does that because the sin was, was sin or sins were so significant that that the person has to pay the price and that if he would do tshuva and it would help that that would um, that would cause a situation where the person didn't get enough consequence because of, of the decisions that he or she did and so this and then the robin goes on to speak in its laws of repentance how the, a classic example of this is by Paro. And, and, and says the rabbi, since Paro sinned on his own decision, you know, based on his own decision, that he started on, on a path of terrible sin. And the rabbi is going to specify that the sin, or at least the category, what 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 do you what do you think the Rambam will say? He didn't do proper tshuva. <laughs> he said he wouldn't, and then he didn't, and it changes mind. Oh, so that's uh, that's an interesting comment, not only for its actual content. But in in the context that you would be referring to, knows we we sp we've been seeing that in the course of the plagues, when when Moshe, you know, uh, comes to speak with Paro, where Paro is uh, eager in most of the cases to have the plague stop, and he makes promises that he will not fulfill. That's why what the Rambam says here is significant. The Rambam says that, that it was Paro who made the decision to, to, to act in a harmful way to the Jewish people living in his land. But Rabbi, yes. Here it says that Hashem hardened his heart. Yes. So he didn't give him the ch choice of free will. 
we're gonna we'll, we will get uh, we'll get up to that. But but if you listen carefully, I, the the Rambam is actually answering your question, Robert, because the 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 Rambam says lefi shechata me atzmo tichila. Because Paro decided on his own at the beginning, and he took actions that that were harmful to to the Jewish people living in his land. I, this is like before slavery. You know that Paro makes the decision that he's going to kill baby male Jewish babies, and then he's going to enslave the people. Like, like it, 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 the, the language of the Rambam is, is talking about a sin that was, that was starting a long time ago. It didn't start, uh, you know, just like when the plague of, of, of Dam of blood, the first of the plagues was visited upon Paro, that he had already built up, you know, for many years, earlier, you know, the plagues start you know, a year before our exodus, a little bit less. But the situation of the Jews being enslaved was going on for 80 plus years already. And, you know, and, and, and the, and the, um, So I just want to read a little bit more about the Rambam and then come back to this question. So the Rambam says is that, you know, one of the messages that we as human beings have to understand from the, the episode of, of Paro is that when God decides to withhold from a person the possibility of repenting, that a person is powerless against God. And that means that um, he, he might not be, he would not be given the chance to, to repent and to ease any consequences coming to him. And the Rabbin goes on to say that whatever, you know, whatever you want to say, you know, you know, we could say that God already ordained to Avraham in that famous vision in the Brit Ben Haptarim that Avraham's descendants were going to be strange in the land, not theirs, and that and that host would. Uh, treat them harshly and make them and, and make them into slaves. But you know what? No one said that power had to, had to be the agent for the fulfillment of that. That was Paro's freedom of choice. So you can't claim that God made me do it. And any, because Rabbi gives a few examples. He says in each of these examples, these people made their own decision. So, so the truth is, is that from the Rambam's language, one could make the point that by the time the plague start, Paro's free choice has been taken away. Now, not, not everybody agrees with that, but it appears from the Rambam's text that whatever caused Paro to lose freedom of choice, which is normally granted to people, that in Paro's case, it, it was already taken away a long time ago because of the severity of his decisions, which led to actions which were horrendous and there was no change, that Paro's punishment was that he could no longer change. Now, um, here's a, uh, 
a, 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 many times I, I see comments recorded in some uh, anthologies from a, a rabbi, Yud Eger. I actually have not found out yet what, what that Yud stands for. There's a very, very famous Rabbi Eger, Rabbi Akiva Eger. This is not Rabbi Akiva Eger. But there is a, a scholar by the name of, of Rabbi Y, Yud, the Hebrew letter Yud, like a Y in English, Eger. And he cites the, the Medrash, which says that, that evil people are in the grasp of their heart, meaning whatever their desires you know, want, that they give into those desires. They don't conquer those desires. But righteous people, their hearts are in their grasp, in their uh, domain of ownership, control. So wicked people give in to certain desires and righteous people conquer those desires. And then he adds the comment. So in our posture, there are, there, are, there are different words that I use for what we call the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Well, I want to look at our parsha because in that very first Pasuk verse of our parsha, it says, Hashem tells Moshe, go to Paro, and for, for I, ani, hechbadeti et libo, hechbadeti, the root word of hechbadeti is kaf vet dalid, kaved, heavy, that's what I use it, heavy, Hashem made Paro's heart and the heart of his key advisors heavy. Now, what does that mean, heavy? So Rav, Rav Eger says, he made it heavy, he made it difficult for them to, to break out of their decision mode. But it was not removed absolutely from them, that they still had the ability to change their ways, but it would require more energy to do it. So that it's not impossible, that the door is always opened a little bit, even at this extreme, it's still open a little bit. It's just very, very hard to seize that opportunity. Now, some other thoughts on the hardening of the heart. Rav Yosef Albo, in his Sefer Ha'ikarim, the book of principles of faith. Rav Albo mentions that the hardening of the heart was that Paro imagined that all of these plagues were just instances of nature. And that he, he wasn't allowed to see the divine hand the divine power behind them. Others, in a, in a way consistent with this approach of the Albo, would say that what Hashem did was to take away the ability to sense the pain, the, the rune, the sorrow, the collapse. I mean, you think about it, when you, when you look at what these plagues did, you know, you know, a lot of us have been uncomfortable during uh, the pandemic of, of COVID-19. Thank God it pales to what the Egyptians had to go through. Both on a personal level in terms of, of the, the uh, inconveniences and the pains and afflictions that went right to their own body. The financial ruin of the Egyptian economy from the plagues. I mean, the Arbev like, finished off the agriculture, the locust, the vow, whatever wasn't uh, smitten by, by previous plagues is gone, gone after the, the, the locust. There'll be an article coming out later today. My, my uh, Pasha points to ponder 
it, it, where I share with you just a, a citation from a Koren, that's Jewish Koren, uh, Tanakh of the land of Israel. It gives you some of the uh, some of the biological di and natural dimensions of the locust. So Paro, according to to uh, you know, to the Alba wasn't able to see the ha hand of Hashem and what was taking place, uh, wasn't able to feel the, the consequences that were going on. You know, it, it's interesting, and some of you may have heard me say this before, but if you, if you have a person who's decided to uh, rob uh, uh, Ruvain's house, and he has it all planned out, and he knows that Ruvain keeps money in his house, you know, he's in the uh, he doesn't go to the bank every day after he finishes his business. He just brings home a, you know, like carries home a, a cloth bag with, with cash in it and keeps it under his bed until he can go to the, the, to the bank a couple of days later. You know, maybe not such a great idea. Uh, and he has it all planned out. You know, he knows like what day of the week he's likely to get the biggest cash stash at Ruvain's house. And he, and he has it all planned out. And as he's about to... Uh, cut a, a, a hole in the, in the glass window and, and get over to a latch to open the door, a huge German shepherd pops up on the windowsill, bears his long teeth, starts growling and barking at him, and our robber-to-be changes his mind and walks away. Now, why did he change his mind? Did, did he become a Baal Tshuva? Was that repentance in, term, in terms of, of, of what he did? What did he say? Was that repentance, thumbs up or thumbs down? Was that Robert a, a, a repentant fellow? No, he was a very practical fellow. He decided not to get you know, chewed up by the, by the German shepherd. But in his heart, he still wanted to rob the house. So, so some will, will say, some, some Jewish thinkers ex explain essentially that God didn't let Paro see that German shepherd. In a way, he had the most freedom of choice. Because a lot of people in, 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 in life aren't always able to do exactly what they want to do because of practical limitations. Not enough money, not enough education, not enough time, whatever it might be. What will the other people say? Whatever the limitation might might be. But if you can't if you can't feel those limitations, then then you have the highest level of free choice. So in a way, God didn't take away power's choice. He just he removed one of the factors influencing choice, which allowed power to do exactly what he wanted. Barbara, did you want to? Say something. I just one of the things you said was that Paro might not have the ability to recognize that Hashem was there, that these were just acts of nature. Now I could see how that's possible generations following it, but first of all, to really be there and to witness that, even though there were Egyptian magicians that could do some of those things. But I still think like to actually be in the room would be hard not to be able to realize something super different was creating these things. But I don't see how that would have helped Moshe accomplish his goals if God wasn't like I thought everything is to make you know other nations understand that there's something different going on here, that there's one God and, you know, it's not ah, about these multiple right. So gods. it's not, right, but it's not that Paro didn't have the opportunity to recognize God's hand. You know, it's not like, you know, we wake up one morning and, you know, whatever we're witnessing, um, you know, even if it's someone who, who miraculously avoided a terrible car crash, and we don't know, you know, was that all his, his own you know, skill that avoided it, was there some kind of divine hand in, involved in it? But here, here, Moshe was there all the time telling Paro, this is the hand of God. Moshe was demonstrating, tell me, Paro, you want, you want the frogs to go away? Said, 
but you said that one of the apportions said that um, that hardening his heart meant that he wouldn't be able to recognize that God did these miracles. Right, right. But what I'm saying is is is, is that at, at, at whatever I say now, there's a very important sequel that's going to come momentarily. But if you're talking about other nations of the world understanding about God, they may not have the same hardening of, of the arteries that Paro had. You know, ultimately, you know, Paro was broken down only after a very severe you know, plague, like the first killing of the firstborn, and he uh, and he opened his eyes more. Uh, there were momentary statements that he claimed, you know, that you know, that God was the the tzaddik, the righteous one. But 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 certainly people, uh, you know, to have all all these calamities happen, you know, in in a relatively short period of time, to have the person who identifies himself as being an emissary of God announce the plague that's about to happen, announce when it's going to be taken uh, away. Uh, you, you know, so most people shouldn't have had the, the difficulty to understand that there really was something divine here. But, but, that, but that could have been, you know, you, know, you know, it's not the only explanation, but some, you know, say that that, that was the hardening of the heart of not to see God's hand, but that's like not seeing the German shepherd. And, and, and it allows power to do whatever he wants to do. You see, you, we see his true colors from the hardening of the heart. We see the, tr the true colors. I want to give you one more variation on this general train of thought and then go back in a way of, to qualify the Rambam and to give a, a, the, the second part of my answer to, to Barbara's question or, or, or comment. And as uh, I, I believe it's the Barbara now who in next week's parasha, you know, what happens at next week's parasha? Paro's gone through, you know, terrible, terrible 10 plagues. And in the end, he just gives up, you know, he, says he can't take it anymore. And he, and he wants Moshe to leave right on the spot in the middle of the night, which Moshe refuses to do. But Paro just has us, you know, we're out of there. Scholars point out that we don't hear about the Egyptian empire for about 500 years after this period of time. So the, the, the impact of, of the plagues on, on Egyptian civilization were severe, were severe. And yet Paro doesn't learn his lesson. He comes after us after he told us to get out. And why did he come after us? Because, and this was God's plan, he couldn't resist where we were. We placed ourselves in a natural trap. We placed ourselves in front of the sea. Well, God placed us there. And there were mountains on the right. And there were mountains on the left. Which meant for the military strategists, all you needed to do to capture these people, maybe get your money back from them, have them as, as slaves again, you just need to seal them off. One line to seal, they can't go up the mountains, three million people, they're not going up the mountains, they're not going into the sea or so he thought, Paro, this is a piece of cake. And so with all of the uh, remorse that we think that power has at the end, with all of the pain that he's feeling, it's just too tempting. I, I can't pass that up. And that's what the Yabab and El says, it was the hardening of the heart. You know, it, you, you don't, it, it's a variation and not seeing that German shepherd. It just becomes just too, I, I forget everything else in the past and what's presenting itself in front of me right now is just too, too tempting, appears too, too easy. No way I can give that up. And, and power marches ahead. And in the end, his whole army is, uh, is drowned. But I wanna, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the other point that I wanna make, which is really be, would be a, uh, like, a, like a, 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 an amended version of the Rambab of Maimonides, and would have been the way that Cheryl started off 
you know, understanding Maimonides. But if you take a look at the, at the 10 plagues and whatever words are used for the, there are three different types of words that are used for the hardening of Paro's heart, you will see that for, for the first five plagues, God's name is not involved in the statement of Paro's heart being hardened. Or in the very first plague, it's a little, it's another variation that he, that he didn't pay any attention to the, to the, to the uh, bloody Nile. But in, but starting with the sixth plague, God's name is mentioned that it was God who hardened Paro's heart. So in other words, not only did God give this Pharaoh approximately the, uh, 79 years to change, but it's Paro himself who was hardening his heart. You know, he decided to ignore what Moshe was telling him. He decided to ignore what the signs are. He decided to ignore the sorrow that was being caused to his nation, the economic ruin. He, deci he decided to ignore all of those things. I mean, on, on different levels, but hopefully not too frequently, we also decide, yeah, I know the light turned red, but maybe I can just go, get, you know, speed up and go through it. No, we, 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 you know, we make um, th th those decisions. But, but Paro decided five times to ignore what was obvious. And then God comes and says, okay, I'm not even talking about, you know, sort of God would say, what happened at the beginning when you started killing Jewish babies and when you started enslaving the people I know I, I gave you up until now to change yourself, but you decided to ignore the messages and the opportunities that I'm giving you. Now, says God, it's too late. You passed the red line. And now I will not let you see what you really should be seeing until the very end. So uh, it, it helps us to understand our, our story, like the last major chapter in our, in our Egyptian experience, the chapter of the plagues, what, what power, was going on. Actually, some other people, you know, some other scholars say that, you know, the fact that Paro saw he could get away with just making a promise to change, but without changing, because he promised Moshe, okay, I'm, I'm going to let them out. And then he, and then Paro changes his mind. So the, the fact that power learned that all I have to do is say, I'll let them out. I don't have to do what Moshe wants me to do. I only have to say what Moshe wants me to say. And then the, the, the pain of the plague will disappear. So that became, you know, an aspect that made power more entrenched into, uh, into his decision-making. But this is not just a story that took place, you know, over 3000 years ago in Mitzrayim. This is a story of human personality. We all have the same, we're all born with the same ability to make decisions. We make choices in life. We can't, we can't blame our choices on anybody else, even though there may be extenuating circumstances, there may be, be a lot of pressures, there may be a lot of temptations, but we are the ones who are making our choices. And if we, and if we handle ourselves right, but we're never too late to repent for anything that we have to repent about and to start a new, a new chapter in, in our lives. So we want to use power as a bad example, but it should inspire us to, to realize the gifts that Hashem does place in front of us. Hashem understands that there are certain weaknesses. It's not a license to sin or to deviate, but it, in, uh, in most cases, we have a chance to set the record right. If we don't take advantage of the chances that Hashem gives us, it's very possible that Hashem withdraws future opportunities. So we want to, we want to seize the opportunities when we can. Some of, uh, any, any comments or questions on this? So I think what I'm going to do is to tell you a, a little story that's connected to what we're saying. Uh, 
because the clock is ticking away. I'm a little bit afraid if I start another topic, uh, we, we won't be able to, to finish it. We're going to go into a farm family sitting around their dinner table one evening. The uh, 14 year old son says, dad, I think in the morning I'm gonna take my rifle and I'm going to uh, shoot some rabbits. And the father says, you know, that's a great idea. Those rabbits are eating up our vegetable patches. That's, that's a big source of our income. They're really, uh, you know, getting in our way. Great idea. Meanwhile, the seven-year-old sister is starting to cry. He says, what? You can't shoot the rabbits. And she's trying to convince her brother not to shoot the rabbits. And, um, you know, the brother's not listening. The father's not listening. Maybe even the mother's not listening. And, and, the, and the girl gets permission. She leaves her table, the table crying. And, and she goes up to her bed. You could hear her crying uh, you know, from her room. In the morning, she comes down and she is all bright eyed, happy. And her mother says to her, oh, yes, I see you're such in a, in a, in a great frame of mind. You know, you know, you know, what, you know, what happened? You know, did you, you, you understood what your brother was doing, what your father was saying? She says, well, I tell you, I prayed to God. I prayed, I prayed to God that every time my brother would shoot his rifle at a rabbit that he would miss. And the mother says to, uh, to her, you know, sweetheart, it's, it's really good to talk to God and to ask God to help. But, you know, sometimes God might not listen to you, would not, may not take action on, on, you, on your prayer. She says, yeah, I know that. That's why I got up very early this morning, took dad's pliers and messed up the sight on the rifle. <laughs> so that's, um, you know, another message. We need God on our side, but when there are things that we can do we're not supposed to re rely on God. So it's a different, a different slice of this uh, he heavy discussion that we, that we were having on how God runs the world and holds us accountable. So we have to use our talents when we can. And uh, I'm not encouraging uh, devious ways, um, but we have to use our talents to accomplish our goals. Any additional questions or comments? Yes, Rabbi, I have a question. Not on rabbits, though, but... Uh, oh, on good, a, it's not my area of expertise. Excellent. Hey, good morning. It's, good morning. It's on an earlier comment you were making uh, regarding uh, children. I have interviews with... Oh, my God. Please, please Excuse? mute. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, just, just, what, just one second. Uh, okay, yeah, yes, Larry. Okay, so it's on... So, a question on your earlier comments regarding the Rambam and Shuva and repentance and how it's a, it's a, a, a path to, to change your ways involving the laws of repentance. My question, and I don't expect an answer, but maybe just your thoughts, is what about if a person wants to change? In other words, they really want to repent for actions that they were not proud of. And I'm not speaking from personal experience, just a general question. Uh, but they want to repent from their actions that earlier they committed earlier in their life. And they truly feel bad about that now. So they adopt or attempt to adopt a Jewish way of life. But they're having a hard time incorporating what you're saying in their heart. So in other words, they want to repent. They believe in the world to come and they want to stand uh, before Hashem, when the uh, person passes and, and say they've done the right thing. But when they're around in this world, they're just having a difficult time accepting that, um, you know, truly believing in repentance, even though they want to repent. It's like what they teach in 12-step programs. So those who have addictions, uh, it could be gambling, it could be drugs. And they tell you, even if you don't believe, act as if, and eventually things will come around. So conceptually, is this the same thing for someone who wants to repent, but they're just having a difficult time incorporating it into their being and in their personality? 
So the Maharal of Prague, it's like a 16th century, uh, he records in uh, his comments on the uh, Torah that Levavot Nimshachim Achaha Pu'ulot in Hebrew is his phrase, that the heart, which is symbolic, you know, because we know it, the brain makes the uh, decisions, but the hearts follow the actions. So in other words, if we know something should be done, should be done or something that shouldn't be done but we have a temptation to or an inclination to you know violate or not fulfill we should we should fake it if the the we should do the the actions are important it's it's not actions are more important than what's uh, up in our in our head the only uh, the only real sin that is possible that one could be punished for just thinking about is uh, is foreign worship, you know. um, but but otherwise, while we're supposed to have the, you know pure thoughts as much as possible, uh, but our actions would you know tell a story. Now it's, it's true. So it's a person you know is is doing something, but they don't feel so committed to it. So it might not be that I don't know for them might it might even be a bigger level of reward doing something that you're not committed just because God says I. You know, I, um, I once wrote an article, you know, based upon, uh, it, it, uh, I think we called it Just Because, that uh, I have a relative whose grandparents were, were very observant, and she had a lot of questions. She wasn't raised by her own parents to be as, as observant, and when she would see her grandfather do certain things, she would ask her grandfather why he's doing that, and he would say, because. He wasn't, he didn't have the opportunity. He was uh, born, uh, I guess, probably in Poland. And, um, you know, they didn't have so many educational opportunities, the average person. Another man from, I remember my, in my youth, I was, you know, friendly with an older man in shul. He told me at six years old, he had to stop going to school and he was selling little chicks to help uh, his family get some additional money. Um, so we, you know, so people don't have the education. So, but in, but in a way, you know, while we're supposed to, uh, you know, uh, expand our intellectual understanding of Judaism as much as possible. But the bottom line is, is that we don't observe mitzvahs because of intellect. We observe mitzvahs because God told us to do it, and maybe one day we'll come, you know, to you know, hopefully further and further levels of understanding. But uh, undoubtedly, there'll be things that we'll never understand. So anyway, so, so faking it, doing the actions is, is a good strategy. Um, just in brief, uh, uh, Rabbi Salavajic has spoken and written about uh, a statement in the Gemara, which asks, what's the least amount of pain that one could experience? And it still counts as, as a, you know, a retribution for, uh, for those actions that, that need that type of retribution. So the Talmud says it could even be misbuttoning your, your sweater or reaching your, your hand into to your pocket and wanting to take out a nickel, but instead you take out a quarter. It's, it's a little bit of, a, of, a, 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 of an inconvenience, but in the scheme of things, it's not so bad. But if I look at it, is that even that, you know, is, it, you know, is a little bit of, of pain. So even that, if we, owe, if we have a debt to God to pay in some kind of inconvenience, or, you know, we can do that. So, it, so it's, it's, it's how we how we look at things that may go wrong in life and, and consider it to be part of what we might owe for, uh, you know, for, for deviating, which we might not even known that we were going off the path at the time. We might not even have, have the knowledge of that. Um, having remorse, uh, making up one's mind that they'll act differently in, in the future. That's an official step of uh, repentance and trying to uh, do good actions. All of those things, there, there's definitely the, the door is open. There's another famous statement that says that God, you know, God will um, help those who are looking for help. Anything else? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to thank you very much for joining with me and with one another today. I wish you a